seed. Over the next few weeks, I'm, I'm kind of introducing you to myself and some of the, the tenets that I operate from, not just as a pastor, but also as a believer, a Christian, the way I interpret Scripture, how we understand what the nature of the church, the nature of the believer's task is. Last week, I took a little bit of time to, to just give you a thumbnail sketch of what I see as my specific purpose, called to be a, 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 a shepherd teacher for the church. And, and today, what I want to do is I want to focus in on what I believe is probably the most important thing for followers of Christ to understand. Today, I'm going to look at the defining commandment that Jesus Christ gave to his followers. This is also the defining attribute that New Testament writers such as Paul and Peter and John lifted up as the highest quality and the standard of behavior for anyone who is known by the nature and the example of Christ. And, and also in our Methodist heritage, John Wesley uses this particular passage over and over and over in his writing and his teaching. So, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Maureen and I had a conversation this week where she said that one year she went on a vacation and she went to three different churches, and each one of those different churches, they preached on the same thing, the Good Samaritan. Well, guess what, Maureen? Get to hear another one today. Luke, chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Behold... A lawyer stood up to put him to the test, meaning Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to the lawyer, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the man was, and when he saw the man, had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then set the man on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, the, the Samaritan took two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer answered, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? God, you have called us to love. You have established the revelation that you are the source of love. When we think about what Christ accomplished for us on the cross, we rejoice that that was done in love. The church is born to be a place of love in the world. So help us to understand what that fully means. Help us to understand how you expect us to love, the quality of that love, and to do to let the world know through us that you love the world. In this message, may my words be yours, that I would speak wisdom and truth according to your will and your word. May our hearts be filled and our minds meditate upon the love you have shown to us, revealed in Christ, and born within us through your Holy Spirit, that it may pour out of us in abundant measure, fill the lives of those we encounter. I pray these things in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So there are two parts to this passage. We have the commandment and we have the parable. And we cannot separate the two because they rely upon each other. They, they inform one another. They're built upon one another. The commandment says, and this is, this is I told you all about the revered translation according to Todd last week. The commandment is this. You will love God with everything that you are. Heart, soul, mind, and body. There isn't anything else to us, is it? So, you will love the Lord your God with everything that you are, and you will love your neighbor as if you were pouring that love out for yourself. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. To pour that love out for yourself is how we are to love our neighbor. The parable of the story wants to make a point about the definition, the, bre the boundary of understanding a neighbor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these in backward order. I want to get the neighbor out of the way first, and then we'll talk about the commandment. Okay? The parable is in response to this wise guy. I say he's a wise guy because we're told he's a lawyer. Now, I don't mean that as a slam against lawyers. What I mean is, is that this is an individual who has taken his life and he has studied the law of God. He is an expert in the covenant law handed down to Moses and kept through the tradition of the Jewish people. The lawyer knows that neighbor is a component of the covenant law. It's a part of what Moses handed down to the people. The lawyer has seen all of the case arguments. He knows all of the precedents established on what neighbor means according to the law. So when he asks this question, who's my neighbor, he's not asking to get information. He's asking to see where Jesus is, to find out how Jesus would fulfill the definition of that word. So Jesus responds with this parable. And it's a parable that is passed over into our English language, isn't it? We talk about good Samaritans all the time. We talk about these people who give selflessly. We even have a whole type of, of law that is nicknamed Good Samaritan Laws to protect people who do selfless acts. But we should not overlook the weight of this parable. We shouldn't try to, 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 to water it down thinking this is just about helping others or doing something good for another person. This parable emphasizes what is the most important thing that we can do with our life in relationship to God. Remember the question that started all of this. The lawyer asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be in good standing with God? What must I do to be in a place where I know that God will be there for me? This is the most important thing that believers, followers of Christ, can possibly build our lives upon. And the funny thing is, is that Jesus doesn't answer the question. He makes the lawyer do. Now I want you to pay close attention to something. When Jesus makes the lawyer answer the question, the lawyer doesn't like the answer. Jesus asks the question, who proved to be the neighbor to the man who was beaten? And the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy. Now we're told, what kind of man that was. A Samaritan. A Samaritan was a dirty word to a Jew. A Samaritan was one who could not be respected or regarded as any word. A Samaritan was one who was not held in high esteem among the people of Israel. He was just a dirty Samaritan. The lawyer was forced to give an answer he didn't like. 
But I think it brings us back to a very curious place. It brings us back to the, cur- the question, who is our neighbor? Who are we supposed to be neighbors to? And I think that when we study the Gospels, when we look at everything that Jesus says, there are four classes of people who are our neighbor. The first one are our kin and our clan. If you go over to John 15, verses 12 through 17, Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command to you so that you will love one another. The first class of people that we have to recognize as our neighbor is our kin and our clan, the people that we are bound to by blood and by bond. That includes our family. It includes our friends, close friends. It includes the Christian fellowship that we share as a church. Anybody that we would turn to at any time and know that they were there for us, that's our first class of neighbor. Those are the people that Jesus says you will love one another. The second class of people we find over in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came up, heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You've truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. To love him with all heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to the scribe, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The second class of neighbor are people who are like us, what we typically call our neighbors, the people that we know, the people that we share a common culture with, the people who who have a a common language, people who have a similar worldview and outlook on how things go around us. They kind of look like us. They kind of talk like us. We all eat at the same restaurants. We all go to the same stores. Those are the people who are like us. The third class of people is who Jesus points out to the lawyer that makes the lawyer sit up and take notice. And that's there in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Jesus looks at that lawyer and says, you know, you're, you're an expert. You know the law. You know what the answer is. You don't, I don't have to tell you this, but you know that your neighbor is somebody who doesn't look like you. You know that your neighbor is somebody who doesn't act like you. It's somebody who doesn't talk like you talk. It's somebody who doesn't even believe how you believe. It is somebody who doesn't see the world like you see the world. It's somebody who talks differently, smells differently walks differently, shops in different kind of places, eats in different kind of restaurants. People who are not like you are your neighbors. And the lawyer said, you mean the kind of person who shows mercy, right? He didn't like the answer he had to give. The answer was is that in the Samaritan story, Jesus is saying our neighbor is somebody who's not like us. It's somebody whom we would normally walk around but when we go back into the Old Testament law it gets a little more specific for example in the book of Leviticus chapter 19 when you reap the harvest of the land you shall not reap your field right up to its edge neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest 
You shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You will leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And then over in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 17 through 22. You shall not pervert justice due to the sojourner or the fatherless or take a widow's garment in pledge. You will remember you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field, or forget a sheaf in the field, and you shall, you shall not go back to get it. It will be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you will not go over them again. That is for the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it. Afterward, it shall be for the sojourner, fatherless, and widow. You will remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. Even in the Old Testament law, it is very clear that the people who are not like the Jews were their neighbors. The sojourner represented somebody who was from another land living among the people. The fatherless were those kids who had no father on which to rest honor. They had no one to provide for their honor. And the widows were ones who had no one to provide for their welfare. Do you hear what I'm saying here? Refugees, immigrants, gang members, and welfare recipients. That's the third class of people is our neighbor. Fourth class of people that is our neighbor are the people who want to do harm to us. This is not an easy one to listen to. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies, do good, lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus says, love those who would hurt you. Love those who do not respect you. Love those who would seek to do harm to you by word, by deed, by action, by motive. Love those who would tear down your spirit. Love those who would destroy your way of life. Love those who would take your homes away from you. This is why I called this sermon, Love the Hard Way. Because it's hard for us to love all those kind of people. All four classes of people, it is very hard to love. Some people want to say, well, I love them in my heart not enough it's not enough one of the great theologians of the 21st century next slide please Billy Ray Cyrus wrote a song in which these words are from prominently featured love is action love is real when we stop and we think about love many times we consider it an emotion we think of it as a feeling, but that is not the reality. Love is doing. The difference between active and passive means active does something, passive doesn't, right? Every time we see love in the commands of Jesus, it is an active word, not a passive word. It is a doing word, not a not doing word. 
Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you will not commit adultery, you will not murder, you will not steal, you will not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You will love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is an action. It is something that we do. It is not something that we don't do unless we think that doing love ends in doing wrong. Love does no wrong. Period. Love your neighbor means we do no wrong to your neighbor. Love is doing, going back to Leviticus 19, 9 through 18. Loving your neighbor meant leaving the gleanings. Now I'm quite sure that some of you all had wheat in the field this year. Y'all didn't have gleanings. But there's some years when there's corners, aren't there? See, in the Old Testament, you couldn't touch the corner. You left the corner so people could go out and get wheat. The ones who couldn't afford to go into the market. The the Leviticus says if you go out and you cut your wheat and you leave a sheaf out in the field, don't go back out and get it. If you get to the house and you're getting ready to put your sheaves of wheat up in the barn, you don't say, oh man, we left that that one back there on the back quarter. The law says leave it says don't beat your olive trees again to get the rest of the olives out leave it don't go back through your vines of grapes and pick more so that you can produce more leave it do good do not steal do not deal falsely do not lie oppress or rob but if we go continually through those laws we also find that this law applies to the capable as well as those who have struggles with full ability. It says, you will not mistreat your hired servant, nor will you try to fool the deaf and the blind. It means justice, true justice, God-like justice for everyone, no matter what their social status, no matter their ability to afford it, no matter the level of their power or the amount of authority that they can gain for them, the law establishes that loving your neighbor is a doing kind of thing. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 8. We've heard this many times, the character and the quality of Christian love. That's not romantic love in 1 Corinthians 13, y'all. That's Christian love. That's the definition, that's the standard. That is how we are all supposed to treat one another, but it's also how we're supposed to treat remember, the ones who are like us, the ones who are different from us, and the ones who want to hurt us. There's not a different standard of love for Christians than there is for people who want to abuse us. There is not a different standard of love between the people who look like us and the people who smell differently than us. It's all one standard of love. And the root and the ground of it is in 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Loving our kin and our clan. Loving the people who are like us. Loving the people who are different from us. Loving the people who want to hurt us are the four classes of people Jesus commanded us to love. Now here's the good news. Very simply, I want to sum my good news up in one thing. Y'all 
have displayed a lot of true Christian love. As I have spent some time listening to what has been happening, listening to what you all have done, you have shown your love for one another, you have shown your love for this community, you have shown your love for the stranger. I haven't gotten to a place about talking about you loving your enemies yet. Okay? We'll wait till we get to know each other a little bit better then and y'all start telling me the real stuff. But, the best three foots forward that you all have put in front of me have shown me that you all love a lot in true Christian love. I am not sharing this sermon to condemn anything that you've done nor to make you guilty about anything you haven't done. I am sharing this sermon to point out to you that my way of deciding things going forward rests upon one commandment. Does this show love for God and love for everyone whom we are supposed to be in contact with? That's my way of deciding going forward. I share this to encourage all of us to pursue that thing which Paul calls the most excellent of ways. Love the hard 